Let's welcome Alex Bradbury. He's going to present developments in LLVM-based tool chains and tooling for RISC-V. Alex Bradbury is a compiler engineer at Egalia and previously co-founder of Low Risk. Alex has been heavily involved in the RISC-V ecosystem since its inception, working across the hardware and software stack. He initiated the upstream RISC-V LLVM backend implementation and is well known for his LLVM weekly newsletter. Over to Alex. Great. Thanks very much. Uh, great. Okay. So, um, yeah, thanks very much for that introduction. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about where we are with LLVM today for RISC-V, um, some of the technical aspects, as well as giving a bit of an idea of where I see it moving forward in the future. Um, so there are obviously a number of things that I'm passionate in, about in life, but uh, two of them relevant to this are really um, open source, so building open source communities and collaboration and compilers, and actually for a very similar reason, in that they're both about building solid fundamentals, uh, shared infrastructure uh, that other people can then use and, contr and contribute to to build you know, other cool and interesting things. Um, I'm not going to say a lot about code generation details in LVM because that would be a whole other talk, and I've given several on those topics. Um, but you probably all have a basic idea of what you know, Clang and LLVM is. It's a compiler framework. You take your C code, let's say here a very, very simple program. Sadly, not all programs are quite this simple. Um, it will then con you know, pass it, convert it to LLVM's intermediate representation, which again may be something that you're somewhat familiar with. And then it goes through a instruction selection process. This is a, a graphical representation of one of the internal compiler data structures called the selection DAG that's helping you map from your um, target independent intermediate representation of what is an add uh, as, you get, as you get closer towards the RISC-V add instruction, which is what we end up with at the end of the day. Um, so there we're going through LVM's machine code layer, emitting an ELF object file, um, choosing how to encode the instruction, and so on and so forth. Um, so as I say, I, I've given some previous talks on how this works, both selection DAG and then about a month ago on global ICEL, the new instruction selection framework. Um, it, a little bit more generally in terms of what is LVM, I, I titled this talk quite deliberately about LVM and LVM-based tool chains and tools because it's actually broader than the tools that you might be familiar with. Um, I think Clang is most well, the most well-known part of the LVM suite. That's the C and C++ language front end. Um, there's a number of reasons that LVM is often interesting to people as a compiler framework. The fact that it's implemented as a uh, in a modular library-based fashion means that it's relatively easy to reuse different components to build these different tools. Uh, its implementation is in modern C++, which in the past was a differentiator versus GCC, but GCC has been kind of moving forwards there. Um, another key one is being permissively licensed. It's under an Apache-style license rather than something that's copyleft like GPL or LGPL. Um, as well as Clang, there's kind of replacements for all of the standard um, GNU binutils type thing, tools you'd be used to using, the minor stuff like Objdump, as well as more interesting ones. Um, and it's also used for primary compilation backend for a newer set of languages, such as Rust, uh, Julia, Swift, and so on. So if you're interested in using any of those languages on RISC-V, you have a hard dependency on the LLVM backend. Of course, as I said before, Clang is itself also a popular C and C++ language front end. A number of uh, downstream vendor tool chains use this for other architectures. Some years ago, ARM switched over to building all their tool chains based on uh, Clang and LLVM. Uh, Apple, of course, for, you know, one of the bigger, bigger investors in the LLVM project and use that for their compilers. Uh, Google have talked very publicly about their use of Clang and LLVM across Android and Chrome, and they've invested in long-term efforts such as Clang built Linux to build the Linux kernel with, uh, with Clang. Um, but it's more than that. There is a whole suite of other tools that you may or may not be familiar with, and there's a mix of things here. Some of them that you may have found, which will be part of standard compiler tool chain, LLD the linker, LDB the debugger, um, some which are a bit newer and more experimental, uh, which I'll talk about a bit later, like LLVM's libc work or Bolt, which is a postlink optimizer. Um, others which are, uh, I guess, very much, very actively discussed and developed right now. Um, so I think MLIR has come up a few times at this event already. Uh, this is a new sub-project within LLVM um, aiming to 
you know, one of the differentiating features of LLVM was its use of this intermediate representation that you can, it's very easy to plug into and write custom passes. That's fantastic, um, but, and you can extend it by adding those new passes or introducing new intrinsics. But what it's not easy to do is to introduce um, new IR instructions, that's quite a complex uh, intervention, or to introduce new data types. MLIR is aiming to provide a generic um, kind of framework or container format to easily uh, implement your own intermediate representation. So that's been used um, a lot in machine learning, um, but also as a um, for compiling from higher level languages, like Flang is an example of a language of trying to compile Fortran to LVMIR through MLIR, and if Clang, the C++, C on C++ front end was developed today, it would most likely would try and go through the MLIR route. Um, so in terms of where RISC V LVM is at, uh, we've been a default rather than experimental backend since LVM or Clang uh, 9.0 back in September 2019. Uh, the first patches, uh, so I, I think as was mentioned in the intro, I kind of initiated that upstream RISC V LVM effort. I started work on that a bit before October 2017. It took a few months to get the initial series of patches up and running. It then took about two years or so from then to go from being something that wasn't turned on by default to something where you know, we did a whole bunch of wide-scale testing and were able to uh, you know, demonstrate that it could build a large corpus of, uh, say, Linux user space applications or um, uh, or spec, uh, GCC torture suites, and so on. Um, so sorry, I've, I've lost the monitor here, so I, I may have to peer at, uh, at my slides every now and again to see what's going on. Um, in terms of, oh, uh, another aspect to, to mention is that you no longer have to rely on talk from people like me to see which uh, RISC-V ISX extensions are actually supported within, L within LLVM. This is something we didn't do a particularly good job about before in that there weren't any um, we, documentation was perhaps a slight weak point, um, but I'll advertise this URL a few times within, within the talk if you want to go and see exactly which extensions we implement and whether it's just at the assembly level or we have code gen as well. We've got a, a kind of up-to-date listing there. Um, and with COVID and so on, it's been a while since one of these updates, so it, this isn't particularly new news, but for a long time, the LVM linker was somewhat behind the GNU's linker in terms of its support for uh, linker relaxation. Um, so this is a transformation that you might recognize we rely on quite a lot within RISC-V. Um, we have a relatively short immediate uh, within our instructions, so just 12 bits, plus obviously a separate instruction to 20 bits, which means that for most, most commonly you end up requiring uh, a pair of instructions, so for common memory access operations, uh, the linker can then go and often delete one of those instructions if it turns out that actually um, you know, you, th those higher bits were needed. Uh, so what I did was had a look at a uh, comparison of what we support versus the recently agreed RISC-V 64-bit um, profile. This isn't really the way in which we've gone about the development of these extensions, but it, it kind of coincides with a list of extensions that people are interested about, interested in. So for everything in the recently ratified, um, sorry, for everything, uh, yes, for everything in the currently proposed but not ratified RVA 22 proposal, we have supports and code gen. The only one that's kind of missing is uh, this ZICC LSM, which was, uh, I was very pleased to see it in, that in the profile specification. Um, that's a way of indicating that your core supports misaligned loads and stores, which is something we didn't previously support in the ISA naming string, which was a real nightmare for the compiler, because although as an end user, you can rely on the fact that misaligned loads and stores will be handled by a trap handler, if nothing else, as a compiler, you don't know that um, someone is actually, is, whether someone is compiling for a context where a trap handler wouldn't be acceptable, say a, you know, a, pro, a Linux kernel or something. Uh, so the support for code gen there is a kind of orange tick because we do indeed have a, um, a command line flag to support that, we just haven't hooked it up to that particular name yet. Uh, looking ahead to what's currently proposed for RVA 23, um, so I've not listed things again that were already in the previous one, Again, we're in pretty good shape. Um, the bits that are missing or slightly work in progress would be, um, so 
bfloat 16. I've uh, been working on, I've finished off the MC layer support. We've, uh, I've also been working on the code gen for that, starting on the scalar side. There have been some recent discussions in the broader community around um, whether the BF16 type should be a storage only or storage and arithmetic type, despite the fact that many architectures don't support all the arithmetic operations, which has largely been resolved. Um, the Z icon, which is roughly what used to be the Ventana conditional operations, we have established code gen support for that. There's still work that I'm aiming to do to Basically, there are a number of uh, slightly heroic optimizations that LLVM does where you can generate a branchless sequence of uh, instructions, even with the, the base instruction set. And once you enable ZICON, occasionally, that, that branchless sequence with the base instruction set would have been better. So there's a bit of tuning to make sure that we never regress on those workloads. Uh, and I guess the big one where we're kind of waiting for more standardization is around the uh, vector crypto, where I think it's largely the intrinsics being agreed as a blocker there. Now, I'm talking about this as what I see it as a real success story for cross-community collaboration on an upstream project um, in that we've kind of started from a, p a point where there was lots of downstream work, a kind of research fork that was, wasn't quite ready for upstreaming, lots of people modifying that to solve our immediate needs. We struggled to get over that hump of getting people actually working together upstream. Uh, and of course, it makes sense to work together upstream because almost everybody in this room isn't trying to differentiate based on a proprietary compiler. Uh, customers, for the most part, aren't particularly excited about tool chains that they're not able to support themselves or modify. I think the, the first contract work that I had in doing um, LVM stuff on RISC V was from one of the uh, one of the semiconductor firms interested in getting involved in RISC V, who were concerned that. You know, a, there was this blocker of people, everybody waiting for somebody else to do the work, but B, that perhaps uh, those who are producing RISC-V IP might have a bit of an incentive to you know, be the one who had the best downstream compiler when actually the global optimum would be to have something that's upstream, that's shared, that we're all contributing to. And you know, full disclaimer for everything in this talk, um, I've done a whole lot of work on RISC-V LVM over a number of years, but it's a huge number of contributors by now. Uh, I've, this is a very incomplete list of people who have been contributing in terms of code, reviews, advice. Um, I think just under 100 people, but adding in the people who I've certainly missed, easily over 100. Um, so it's been a huge group project. Um, but another proviso on this slide is that I don't want you to look at this and think, aha, there's a small army of people already working on RISC V LVM. There's nothing more I can contribute. This is, as with many open source projects, there's a small core of people who are um, perhaps doing most of the ongoing day-to-day -day work. Um, but what it's demonstrating is working really well is that open source aspect where someone sees something that's broken, they're able to come in, produce a patch, get it committed, and you know, move on. So I think this is some, it's demonstrating that aspect has really been working well. So in terms, it's roughly 4,500 commits uh, and roughly 56,000 lines of code just focusing on the LLVM backend part. More lines of code spread throughout the rest of the LLVM repo, and of course many more in, in tests and the like. Um, and how we actually work on this, uh, it may surprise some people who perhaps haven't followed LVM before. There's no kind of top level LVM committee who agree what features are on the roadmap, what's going to be in the next release of LVM as a whole. As a whole, it's purely time based. Each company contributing to LVM manages their own engineers, decides which things are important to them. If it gets in and it gets agreed by a consensus before the, its branch, then it's good. And if not, well, it'll make it into the next release. And so that's how prioritization works in that context. It'll be really interesting with, you know, we've had a number of talks talking about Rise. That should provide a good forum for multiple companies with resource to contribute within the LVM ecosystem to do that kind of prioritization that perhaps would be going on at other firms like you know, Arm and Intel and the like. Uh, and everything about, almost everything about the collaboration within this is actually all upstream using the standard community um, methodologies. So there isn't a LVM working group within RISC V International because that wouldn't make sense. There's an existing collaboration process. It would be um, kind of wrong. It might come across as somewhat rude if a bunch of people in a separate organization are telling LVM what to do. So if there's a change that might be controversial or might be disruptive perhaps to others in the ecosystem or go through, through the standard RFC process, the discussion takes place on the upstream LVM mailing lists or now move to discourse forums. 
Uh, we make heavy use of pre-commit review and use a kind of code owner system. So I'm technically the code owner for RISC V LLVM, having started it and being the initial author. But these days, there's probably three or four of us who are you know, doing the bulk of kind of last level reviews. And a big piece of this also has been the biweekly uh, kind of sync ups or coordination calls, which is used quite a lot within LLVM. And we found it incredibly helpful for helping to unblock patches because um, there's we all know with code review, there are some kind of feedback where it's really, really helpful, but other things where it's a bit more of a design question, you can just get stuck in a very long uh, comment thread that doesn't really go anywhere. So just getting people together on a call and figuring out is it actually option A or option B we want, or can we think for a better one, and then going away and reworking things is really helpful. Um, so that's, uh, well, I, I've said bi-weekly here because I would call it fortnightly, but everybody else thinks that I'm, you know, perhaps people who aren't British think I'm just making up the word, but um, we're, that takes place every other Thursday, um, so I think I have a link later on in, 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 the slide, uh, in the slide deck. But it's not just upstream in, within LVM, there's obviously a lot of overlap with RISC-V standards and, uh, and also with GCC, importantly. It's very important to us that if GCC and Clang are implementing roughly the same feature, it would be kind of um, unfortunate for everybody if we had an arbitrarily different way of specifying that via a command line flag. So that's where things like the RISC-V toolchain conventions repo comes in, where we're trying to coordinate that work with GCC. That one's relatively informal. It's basically just for the, you know, us developers uh, discussing and trying to find consensus. Something that's rather more formalized would be the PSABI, so the calling convention, um, other details of the ABI, where there is a RISC-V working group, and uh, Keto and Jessica have done a really fantastic job of moving that forwards. And of course, we're reliant on the ISA specs and you know, other things such as around assembly mnemonics and uh, those kind of things. Another important aspect is how we handle not yet ratified or vendor specific extensions. I said on a previous slide that you know, we're just trying to integrate with the kind of native standard upstream LVM development process. That's not, but this is a case where there's a gap because RISC-V isn't quite like other architectures in this respect. If you have a, a new ISA extension from ARM, let's compare the RISC-V vector extension versus ARM's SVE. Uh, obviously, lots of people had access to SVE beforehand, but once it was public, or well, that was the first time that the kind of public upstream LLVM saw the spec and initial, you know, initial patches implemented. We don't have that restriction within LLVM, within RISC-V rather. All the work on extensions is going, out, is go, is going on in the public, and we'd really be missing an opportunity to get things, uh, you know, collaborate on a shared repository if we didn't try and take advantage of that. So that's why we work through an agreement that we can merge support for standard extensions that aren't yet ratified behind an experimental flag. Um, however, there's no backwards compatibility guarantee. There's no, you know, if we're in Bitminute moved from 0.93 to 0.94, 0.93 is gone. We're not going to support that again, and then we'll only support the final ratified version. This means that we can actually work together upstream. And an important aspect of this is usual code review standards apply. It's not that we commit it and then fix it later. You know, the usual rigorous making sure that it does the right thing in the right way all applies. Another bit I just wanted to highlight is that vendor extensions are also fully supported. Um, we have a number already upstream. There's more of a framework, I suppose, for deciding when it makes sense to support it upstream. There's more of a discussion around what would the burden be on the upstream community? Are people going to support it? How disruptive is it? These things. Um, I, I won't go into detail about kind of custom passes that uh, are done within, within the RISC-V backend to optimize for it, but broadly speaking, when writing an LVM backend, you've got some kind of standard infrastructure code you need to write. You've got the uh, instruction set definitions. You've got a whole bunch of hooks that try to customize how the target independent passes work, but then you want to go and do some additional passes to try and optimize for specifics of the RISC-V architecture. The two, maybe three most interesting paths here would be around handling of the W suffixed instructions on RV64, so whether we can generate an add W or not, and when it would be beneficial to do so. Um, there was a really good talk from Craig Topper at Sci-5 at last year's LVM dev meeting going into great depth on that. Uh, a whole bunch of things around vector instructions, so minimizing the VSET VLI and CSR switching. Um, as well as optimizations at instruction selection time or around about that time that might enable better code compression. In terms of what's been done recently, uh, there's been a lot of work on auto-vectorization. 
Um, there's two forms of auto vectorization within LLVM the loop vectorizer and the SLP vectorizer, superword level parallelism. Uh, the loop vectorizer is enabled upstream by default. There's also some additional downstream work with BSC and others working on one particular tail folding approach with vector predication intrinsics. There's a lot of tuning to be done. We've been doing some recent work with a customer um, to add support for generating scalable strided loads and stores or scalable interleaved and deinterleaved loads and stores. Um, there's, we're also very, very close working with others to enable SLP um, vectorization by default. The main reason it's not is just need it, the need to adjust the cost model so that it's never kicking in in cases where actually scalar code would have been better. Uh, and you know, the, cur the current version of Intrinsics is supported, though we eagerly await version 1.0 being finalized because that's perhaps been a slight pain point that there's been changes within the RISC-V vector intrinsic spec. Bolt is a project I wanted to talk about a little bit. Uh, this is something we took on kind of more speculatively, looking to uh, partially build more experience working, on the working with linker technology with RISC-V. It's a post-link optimizer. It was contributed to, to LLVM by Facebook, typically used to speed up large applications, you know, multi-megabytes, those that might suffer from high instruction TLB or instruction cache misses. Uh, it works by taking a sampling profile, disassembling the functions, reconstructing the CFG, and applying a number of optimizations, but primarily code layout optimizations, so things that would impact those metrics. Um, and it previously supported just x86, 64, and ARCH64. We were keen to add RISC-V support for it. And it's actually a pretty interesting example of the kind of work that you end up having to do sometimes to get something that's upstream. So this diagram here is it's not um, a, a diagram of how you get around on the subway around Barcelona. Uh, this is actually a, a visual representation of the set of patches in different bits of different subsystems that one of my colleagues had to touch to get this done. Um, so Bolt is built on top of actually one of the dynamic linker components within LVM, except it was a deprecated one. So we had a, two options. We could either go and add RISC-5 support to the deprecated one, or we could evaluate moving Bolt as a whole to the newer um, dynamic linker implementation. Uh, so we actually implemented both, but you know, went with moving it to the newer one because you know, moving something upstream, it's really about negotiation. Uh, in a sense, there's... Uh, the upstream maintainers are always happy to see new proposals and new submissions, but it's often not for a target that they currently work with or they're paid to support, so what can we give in return? In this case, we saw a route to supporting um, this newer JITLINK infrastructure rather than the old dynamic linker, and that would mean we wouldn't have to maintain both the old deprecated one and the new one for RISC-V, um, and it also turned up a number of bu bugs, both within Vault and within JITLINK, that we're able to fix. And, and we've also gone and added linker relaxation support to that um, dynamic runtime linker as well. Uh, so again, that enables other applications. LVM libc is another one I mentioned before. And this is another one of those in that category where I'm not mentioning it because it's mature and it's finished, but I'm mentioning it because it's not. So now's a time when people are actually discussing design decisions, getting involved in how it might target um, conceivably more embedded targets as well as just Linux. Uh, and it, yeah, Google have been working on RV64 support on LVM's libc, which is now at the same level of completeness as x86-64. Um, we've also, uh, one of my colleagues has helped with that and also been working on 32-bit support. I'm personally quite excited about the, concept, the idea of this for Embedded, because I've worked with a number of companies who have their own libc because they're not quite happy ingesting new lib. Like, new lib is great, but it's got like, almost 200 kilobytes worth of license descriptions in its uh, top-level directory, which is an example of them doing a great thing in terms of auditing all their licenses. Uh, but if you're a company who's auditing all the code that you ingest, perhaps rather complicated versus a simple single license. Uh, so it's actually Arm have been contributing to try and guide how that might work well on Embedded. Uh, CI has been one where we've improved a fair bit on the LVM side. And uh, all I would say there is that for everybody who's been contributing to QMU, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Having real hardware is fantastic, but uh, particularly for functional testing, it's very hard to beat the flexibility and scalability of just having a commodity fast x86-64 uh, machine spinning up as many QMU instances as I need to and running a whole bunch of tests. And of course, you, given that we're always working with extensions that either aren't quite yet finished or have only just been finished, uh, simulation is the way to go there. And I perhaps uh, missed a little bit around the embedded space, uh, but there's a whole bunch of work there around code size reductions or the FNX instructions, which have landed recently. 
In terms of how this changes going forward, so I feel as though we're maybe reaching a bit of a new phase in that, yes, there's ongoing enablement as new extensions appear. Um, there's always, you know, it's an endless task to optimize and further maintain your work. I should probably have a little dotted line here from optimization to maintenance as your optimizations introduce new bugs. Uh, but I also see us moving to a slightly different phase and both with uh, more and more hardware targeting different use cases, becoming closer to market, seeing people getting much more focused on particular workloads they care about, doing more detailed performance analysis, which I'll highlight again is a really fantastic way to contribute, even if it's not direct LLVM engineering. The more that you can point to things where you've actually spent some time trying to run it on your system, the code isn't as good as you hoped it was, and you've invested that kind of analysis time to figure out why, submitting that bug report is absolutely fantastic because us compiler engineers can spend more time going and fixing that rather than doing um, you know, that analysis work. So things like you know, the Android work is also redirected efforts. Um, but I'm also thinking a little bit ahead in terms of you know, some of the things I'll talk about as potential future directions. There's things that LVM, that the RISC V community isn't very active in right now. It's being led by vendors who are targeting other architectures. So the uh, of course, I'm not suggesting we should be running before we can walk. Um, this kind of getting things production ready is very important, um, but it's very normal to have more of a kind of production strand of work and a more of an R&D strand of work. And it feels as though there are more aspects within compilation, particularly compilation RISC V, where we could be being getting involved in the next set of projects for new workloads or things that are a bit more of a gamble, uh, say around. Um, formal verification where there's lots of interesting work right now with um, Alive and super optimization, uh, things like, I've done some work previously, uh, one of my colleagues at Loris did some work on um, adding in support at the compiler level for mitigating against fault injection attacks, um, also did some more work on that on the research side, which again is an interesting kind of area. Um, in terms of features that I see as arriving in the future, big disclaimer on this side, not a declared roadmap, this is just from talking to people, seeing what, um, where logically there are gaps that need to be filled. These are the kind of areas that I see people working on in the future. Um, and this isn't scaled, so if you were to scale it to level of interest or importance, for a lot of people, this whole slide would probably be auto-vectorization. Maybe the next, size would, next slide would be code size. Um, but I, I see some pretty, there's maybe a few things which are perhaps smaller gaps that we have now, like link time optimization, works on RISC-V, but there are a few bugs related to merging, um, to merging object files that are compiled for slightly different uh, architecture targets. Uh, some of the things that were mentioned in the, in the uh, Android talk, like around TLS desk, the Atomics ABI changes, which is an example actually of where vendor input would be very valuable, as there's this discussion around a slight tweak to the ABI that may have some performance implications. Um, and in terms of how to get involved and keep track, I've mentioned the bi-weekly sync calls. Um, I've been maintaining an, a kind of newsletter of what's going on in LVM for almost 10 years now. It'll be 10 years in January for literally every week with no week missed somehow. Um, so it, for, it includes everything that's going on in LVM, including uh, RISC V. Obviously, RISC V normally gets mentioned quite well because I'm very up to date on it. And I also try and, alongside the release notes, where I think we've We've got a lot better with release management more recently as more people are using the release versions, but I try and do a bit of a narrative of particularly interesting features that you might want to look into. And just to kind of end this, I'd like to thank everybody who's contributed so far. Um, I've kind of covered, I think, as much as I've been able to in the time, how I view RISC V LVM as a model of us working very well together with upstream collaboration. And this isn't really about you know, pats on the back, but you know, people do deserve a pat on the back. This is, the point here is that this is a, a community that's functioning very well. That means that any time you invest in helping move forwards upstream LVM will be time well spent. We've all worked on projects where you put something in and you don't really get anything out. I don't think that'll be the case here. We all have, there are challenges getting anything upstream open source. If you have issues, do reach out to me privately via email or otherwise. I can help get those unblocked. I covered some of the big recent milestones and developments, kind of where I see things going in the future. And I'd be very interested in talking to anybody else who's thinking a little bit more about either the research side or maybe performance modeling is a big thing. I mentioned QMU is fantastic for functional modeling. At some point, we'll have hardware, but we always have that gap between what's available today and the kind of micro architectures that people are targeting. So open source uh, performance modeling solutions and flows are of great interest, I think. 
Um, so at that, I think I've out of time. I don't know if we have any time for questions or not, but if not, catch me at the rest of the conference or drop me an email afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. It's really inspiring to hear the community working together on that scale. Um, we have uh, different timers. I, I have still a couple minutes for questions. Does somebody have something? Oh, we have one here. Thank, thank you. Do you see uh, MLRIR MLR making inroads into RISC-V, especially with regard to the various extensions? Uh, so, I mean, there has been some upstream, some discussion from one group around a RISC-V vector dialect of MLIR, um, and there's certainly been work on dialects targeting kind of, you know, there's an AVX dialect of MLIR, there's work on a SVE or ARM streaming extension dialect, so it, it makes, it seems as though it makes logical sense, um, though I, it would be interesting to see how that, to better understand exactly which use case people are trying to solve with that. But it, it seems inevitable that there'll be more and more work with RISC-5 and MLIR. Okay, let's thank Alex again. Thank you. And. Uh...